For more frequent video uploads, feel free to support Animeko High at Patreon. The link is in the description below. However, one might wish to indulge in luxury once in a blue moon, and some people certainly had that kind of cash from challenging the labyrinth. As hosts, it was our job to offer places for those types of people to spend money on, too. Speaking of which, clearing floor 10 of the labyrinth was equivalent to a group defeating a black spider, a B-ranked monster, in other words, a team of rank C plus adventurers or higher. If a person could beat a black spider alone, they would have to be rank B or higher. Therefore, I had no qualms about granting these adventurers corresponding privileges. Furthermore, if you viewed it through the lens of a small country, they would be strong enough to be hired as knights. If you were rank B in the Freedom Association, then you could be recruited in any country. By acknowledging their position this way, they would naturally pay more attention to their own conduct. Additionally, if they were B-ranked adventurers, then they most likely possessed a decent amount of money. The same logic applied to labyrinth challengers. Ellen's group in particular seemed poor, but exceptions prove the rule. In any case, there were no second chances for troublemakers. The high-class area was surrounded by a moat and heavily guarded. It was explained to everybody that they would be prohibited from re-entering once they were chased out. Since no one became upset upon hearing that, it appeared our public image-building strategy was a success. Merchants, being merchants, came in droves to barter for weapons and artifacts manufactured in Tempest. There were also those who performed high-value transactions, so there were quite a lot of rich individuals. The number of customers gradually increased over time, even without us giving away accommodation vouchers. The weapons and armor Karabe's disciples forged and the craftsmanship of Dold's disciples were of great renown among the merchants who purchased them due to their unparalleled quality. However, something I didn't expect was merchants secretly buying equipment discovered from the treasure chests inside the labyrinth. I had mixed feelings about this, but we were being careful not to let anything dangerous slip through our fingers, so we decided to monitor the situation for now. Every time any of our items were sold in other places, it spread our reputation ever further. Perhaps as a result of that, the number of regular customers had recently been on the rise. Word of mouth was truly impressive. You might wonder why we were doing all this with the threat of war looming, but the war was a whole separate issue to itself, and this was another. I'm aware that I'm doing whatever I want. I am on guard against an imminent danger, but I won't let that fear rule me. I refuse to surrender my daily life and will keep moving forward. Just as the capital city was steadily progressing, so too was the transportation network to other countries. With Benamaru's persuasion, we were able to secure Mamiji and the Tengu's cooperation. The tunnel was now open as well, and almost all of it was paved, save for certain parts. The handover to the civil engineers brought by Duke Elalude had been completed, and a direct road would soon be opened between Tempest and the Sorcerer's Dynasty of Sarian. Moreover, construction of the railroad linking the Kingdom of Farmanas had also begun and was rapidly heading towards completion. The tracks to the Kingdom of Ingracia were operating as planned. The same applied to the Dwarven Kingdom, where an in-town developed around the train station on their side. The point where the road passed through the Great Jura Forest and met with the Great Amald River was an ideal resting place and thus it served as the location for a base during construction. In addition, since the railroad tracks were laid along the river, using this site as an intermediate outpost killed two birds with one stone. Even monsters that lived in the surrounding area gathered there and formed a small settlement. It would have been a waste to leave it as is, so we expanded that town further into an in-town. In the future, this modest in-town would likely grow to become a major city with a terminal, so its importance couldn't be underestimated. The road widening project was finished on Eurasania's side, too. There was still some paving to be done in some sections, but traffic could pass through without any issues. Merchants had been constantly pleading, it would be nice if you could finish it soon, because riding a high-speed carriage on a bumpy road was enough to make anyone sick. Regardless, compared to what they had before, safety and convenience had improved significantly. We had installed street lamps for travelers who moved at night and automatic magic generators at fixed distances, so the barriers that stopped monsters from approaching the road operated without any gaps in coverage. Thus, in less than a year, the development of the transportation network was more or less completed. We had begun preliminary operation of the commercialized Maji train by running it all the way to Dwargon, as well as the Kingdom of Ingracia. Here, we would be able to gather raw data and iron out problems that arose. The various experimental trials had already been performed, so in other words, this was a real-world test. The Maji train made it possible to move an overwhelming amount of goods while maintaining an average speed of 50 km per hour. And so, the history of logistics would forever be rewritten.
It had opened the door to transporting fresh produce from faraway lands without it ever going bad. This allowed access to a richer diet, and I believed it would also contribute a lot in the fight against famine. Indeed, logistics was indispensable in increasing a nation's power, I reaffirmed this belief once again. In parallel with the data collection, a detailed operational cycle was also being considered. A trial and error method was underway to create a timetable. The distance between the Dwarven Kingdom and the Tempest Federation was around 1,000 kilometers. If we traveled at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour, we could arrive in 20 hours, less than a day. Ingracia, on the other hand, was approximately 300 kilometers away, so it could be reached within six hours by train. We worked these figures out after accounting for a considerable amount of safety margin. Theoretically, the Maji train could quadruple its current speed, and the cargo capacity was calculated to exceed 1,000 tons. However, I thought that it would be difficult to handle unexpected problems if we started running it at full capacity, out of the blue, without any previous experience. First, we needed to observe the situation. It was bound to experience issues during its service, and we had to take breaks into account as well. Since there were limitations to the continuous operation of the Maji train, nighttime service was currently suspended. Besides, it was unfeasible to keep our engineers and drivers working around the clock unless maintenance, such as replacing broken or worn parts, was performed at night, for uninterrupted service all day. So far, we had 20 locomotives that were ready to go. Each train formation would consist of six cars, one locomotive, two freight cars, and three passenger cars. The passenger cars contained 80 seats but could accommodate a maximum of 150 people. However, the downside was that they would have to spend hours standing up, so it was better to prohibit this. If we set at least 200 passengers per operation as our goal, we could achieve an occupancy rate of over 80%. Then, how high would we need to set the fair price per person? No, wait. Why do I have to think about these kinds of problems? I just have to leave it all up to Muir Miles Kuhn, he'll handle it just fine. It was only a matter of time before the train became fully operational, and as we gradually got more experience, I felt that we could cram in just a few more people, to make the most out of each train. Our goal was to run the train at a speed of at least 100 km per hour and to increase its length to about 10 cars. This wasn't a dream, but a fact that would soon be made a reality. Well, the results of the past year had been truly tremendous. I believe that the announcement of these results would be met with surprise and excitement around the world. A bright future would come into light, and our efforts, our country's resourcefulness, would surely be known in every land. Improved standards of living, delicious food, and a variety of entertainment gathered from countries around the world. It all promised a fun and interesting life, something that was unthinkable when I had just reincarnated as a slime. I could freely devote myself to my hobbies if only we didn't have a problem with the Eastern Empire. It suddenly occurred to me that Veldora and I, along with volunteers, could declare war and immediately invade the empire. I've heard that if we developed civilization too quickly, an army of angels would rain down and attack, but we didn't even know where they came from. Therefore, it'd be hard for us to launch a preemptive strike, but the empire was a different story. Since they're openly preparing to attack us, they can't complain if we barge in first, that was what I'd thought. Waiting wasn't in my nature, and no matter how you looked at it, attacking would be easier for us than defending. If what the Empire sought after was the annexation of the Western nations, then there was no reason for them to invade the Great Jura Forest. They could always choose to ignore us. Veldora's resurrection was already well known, and a little research would reveal that antagonizing me meant making an enemy out of Veldora as well. The ball was in the Empire's court. Yet, this situation was giving us a considerable amount of stress. How about we consider the possible routes for invading the Western nations? First off, a sea invasion was implausible. Considering the attacks of the great sea creatures, even if they prepared a large number of Dreadnought-class battleships, safety wasn't guaranteed. Fighting in the domain of gigantic aquatic monsters was too risky to be an option. It wasn't even clear if they could safely navigate the ocean. The conditions would be miserable for knights if they were forced to battle on the sea, as they'd have to deal with the rocking of the waves. Furthermore, another question arose, just how many ships would they need to amass if they wished to transport a large number of soldiers? If they planned to send soldiers in the tens of thousands to the Kingdom of Famenas, Yum's side wouldn't be standing idly by. They were prepared to defend themselves and meet the enemy in battle. As long as they couldn't establish a beachhead in the first wave, it'd be impossible for the Empire to send reinforcements. Imposing sea beasts behind them and the Kingdom of Farmenas in front, if that happened, the morale of the Empire's troops would plummet, and it'd be as good as a tactical victory for our side. Thus, another question arose, 
Ignoring Farmenas, could they use a different approach by invading northern Ingracia? The conclusion was that it would also be challenging. Ingracia's northern border was the playground of demons. Guy didn't seem too keen on keeping his subordinates in check, and Testarossa's men were now in charge of its defense. It was a constant battleground for belligerents, and if the empire were to invade, then they could expect to become a target of opportunity. Therefore, an attack via the sea was unfeasible. Next, you had to consider a land invasion. They needed to take a route through the Dwarven Kingdom or cross the Dragon Roost in the Canaan Mountains. The latter possessed too great a risk, so it'd be discarded as an option. After all, marching at an altitude higher than Mount Everest would be suicidal, regardless of how well prepared you were. It would be impractical for them to train ordinary soldiers into mountain climbing experts, and even if they did, a group of dragons, who were A-ranked monsters, would be waiting for them. Common sense dictated that no one would be stupid enough to choose this route. Then, what about going through the Dwarven Kingdom? When this possibility was pointed out by Wisdom King Raphael San, Hanata investigated it in my stead, and she confirmed that it was theoretically possible for a large army to pass through. However, Gazel wasn't someone who would ever permit this, and if the Empire forced their way through, then they would need to battle the Dwarven Kingdom before they could face the Western nations. The invasion of the Dwarven Kingdom was as reckless as it sounded. The armed nation of Dwargon, who declared neutrality, had a highly trained standing army to guarantee their security. Their armaments, which made full use of their technological prowess, were simply exceptional, and it was said that the dwarves had no weak soldiers among them. To begin with, based on its topography, the Dwarven Kingdom was built like a fortress. If they just protected their entrances, they could stave off any attack, even one by an enormous army. Eastern, Western, and Central, among these three entrances, if the Empire were to invade, they would choose either Eastern or Central. Western was connected to the Kingdom of Farmenas, so they wouldn't have to worry about that. Eastern was the most dangerous and at risk, since it shared a border with the Empire, but as expected, Gazel was nothing but prepared. He'd been concentrating the bulk of his forces in this area in order to keep an eye on the Empire's movements. If something were to happen, I planned on quickly responding to their call for aid, and the Dwarven Kingdom was also safe in Gazel's hands. This was the current situation surrounding our country. In the end, I felt that the Empire's only option was to go through the Great Jura Forest. That's it for this video guys. Thank you for always watching my videos and supporting my channel. Shout out to Wilfred Miller. Wabalabadabdub, Mr. Jaha, Rambaru, Luminaseka T, Chad Vota, Razdi, Brian Wheeler, Ronald Estacado, and last but not least, shout out to Chill Homer. I'll see you guys in the next video.